Okay, thanks. Uh, I was supposed to go second, so uh, I was hoping to respond to Norman, but that will not be, at least not for the moment. The debate is entitled Free Speech, Restricted or Unrestricted. I have to say, uh, under capitalism, the idea of unrestricted free speech is a complete nonsense. It doesn't exist and it doesn't occur. Uh, the idea that you can say whatever you want to whomsoever you want, regardless of the consequences, simply doesn't exist. So we, we have to uh, take on board what free speech means in the actual context of the society we live in. The fight for free speech uh, in the labour movement, uh, and indeed in the radical movement, is, uh, has a very, very long tradition uh, with the Chartists, the Levelers, and many other radical movements, the imprisonment of pamphleteers, uh, radical historians and speakers, and so on. So, I mean, it, it, it's not an illusory or negligible uh, movement uh, or, or idea. I mean, free speech is incredibly important, but it's not an abstract idea any, either. It's, we have to see free speech in the context uh, of the society we live in uh, and how free speech has been used uh, from uh, Peter Lou to today, uh, from uh, the minor strike, uh, where <laughs> shouting out uh, scab, for instance, would get you arrest, or to the trial uh, of uh, Julian Assange and the possible deportation of him. Uh, free speech has consistently been under attack, and therefore it's something very real, and the question is how we defend it. Uh, I am opposed to the uh, to the idea that you can have unrestricted free speech. Uh, it, it, in many ways, it, it is a nonsense. Not only that, but th this libertarian idea actually allows for speech, which is anything but free, uh, and is directed at particular targets that they have in mind. The belief in the battle of ideas, and I've heard this from a number of uh, members or supporters of the communist party Great Britain, that good ideas will triumph over bad ideas. This assumes uh, that we live in a rational society uh, where good ideas will win out over bad ideas. They don't. Uh, what we have to ask about all ideas really is what class interests lie behind those ideas. In other words, free speech it is part of the, it is situated in the arena of a political and class battle. For example, uh, the most obvious case today uh, in academia in Britain is uh, the case of David Miller. Uh, at the very same time that the Conservative government is putting forward uh, the idea of a free speech champion in the universities, in order that any speech, uh, whether it's Holocaust denial, or racism of any form or another, uh, or another uh, can be allowed into campuses uh, and defended on the grounds of free speech. The government is giving uh, a nod and a wink to the Zionist campaign to remove David Miller from Bristol University, uh, to sack him in other words, because he has offended the Union of Jewish Students and Jewish Board of Deputies and other Zionist interests. Uh, and I have to ask, I mean, how is free speech compatible with uh, the dictatorship of the proletariat? Is it seriously argued that in revolutionary struggles, we would allow free speech to our enemies, knowing full well that they wouldn't be debating ideas, they would be using that free speech in order to attack us, in order to destroy us? For instance, can you imagine uh, during the minor strike, allowing a group of scab miners to organize meetings in order to defeat the strike. Uh, I don't think so. It's simply not the case. Uh, likewise, uh, the battle against fascism. I mean, fascism is the deadliest enemy of the labor and working class movements. It uses free speech, uh, not to uphold it, but of course to destroy it. The idea that we would allow fascist organizations to organize meetings whose sole purpose is to remove our own democratic rights it is just absurd. We have to defend our, right, our own democratic rights precisely by ensuring that fascists cannot take advantage of them. Uh, 
let me give a, 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 an example because ideas don't come without baggage. They're not separable uh, from uh, the material forces in society. Uh, they actually have a, a material weight. And what do I mean by that? That there are some ideas which achieve in Gramsci in terms a hegemony. So that whatever rational ideas, whatever rational arguments you use against them will have absolutely no weight or very little weight. Uh, and a contemporary example of that is the International Holocaust Remembrance Alliance definition of anti-Semitism. Anyone who is acquainted with that whatsoever knows it is a complete piece of nonsense. It makes no sense. It's internally contradictory. Uh, on the one hand, it says you can't hold Jews responsible for what Israel does. On the other hand, it says Israel is the outcome of a national uh, self-determination struggle, and therefore Jew it is a Jewish state. I mean, th that's just one example uh, of a number uh, of the problems with the IHRA. Yet the IHRA has become in the Labour Party and in wider society, almost unchallengeable. It is accepted uh, as a totem. Uh, and if you oppose it, you are almost automatically anti-Semitic. Uh, so I give that as one example. I mean, I see the, this, this fetish of unrestricted free speech as falling into the same trap as the Revolutionary Communist Party did 20 years ago. We see what the RCP is today. It's a, it edits an internet magazine called Spiked. Uh, it had something called the Institute of Ideas. I'm not sure it was very much of an institute, but those people today are on the far right of politics. They're funded and supported uh, by the Koch brothers, for example, uh, who are anything but supporters of free speech. Uh, and this abstract idea of free speech, I think, plays into the hands of the far and the libertarian right, because it assumes something that can never be anyway. What it really does is allow the inroads of far right groups into our own institutions and organisations. And I think we should be very wary of this. It's also based, of course, on the idea that the West itself uh, is the repository of democracy to begin with. Uh, whereas in fact, uh, as we see today, the West uh, is uh, an imperialist, it consists of the imperialist powers, which are busy uh, engaged in uh, undermining the rights and the freedoms of people in the underdeveloped countries. And in Britain today, we see massive attacks on freedom of speech, whether it's Julian Assange, the women's vigils at Clapham, the police and crime bill. And our response, I think, uh, should be that, ironically, of Extinction Rebellion, which laid siege to and prevented the, the mass newspapers, the newspapers controlled by a handful of billionaires, which, which are destructive of freedom of speech, uh, they don't enhance it, uh, they stop them being distributed. And of course, the reaction from Priti Patel and others in the government was one of hysteria uh, to the very idea that they did not have the right of free speech. So they understand that free speech is something that has to be mediated in a class society. To actually posit it above class forces, I think it's absurd and unmaterialistic and incidentally unmarxist. So where would I draw the line? I think very one very simple way is to say that those who argue for the denial of humanity and the other, don't themselves have the right to free speech. If they're, they're in essence arguing that some species of humanity should be destroyed or laid to waste, then they have forfeited that right of uh, free speech. And to allow them the right of free speech, to not try and, for instance, as we have done with fascist marches and meetings, close them down and stop them organizing, is to actually accept the right of fascists to organize with all the consequences uh, resulting from that. And that means we have to make it clear in a sense that fascism and the working class movement has always understood that, that fascism is its mortal enemy. Uh, and it's not a question of the battle ideas, but it's a, it's a question of balance of forces and the clashes of forces. 
the defeat of fascism is in itself a triumph for the democratic spirit and the survival and prospering of freedom of speech. Uh, to accept that fascist and racist speakers, and I mean organized racist speakers, those who organize around racism, should have, have an unfettered right to organize uh, is, is a bourgeois democratic idea. It, it's got very little to do with socialism. Now, I mean, I understand Norman uh, and Norman Finkelstein and when, where, where he comes from. And he, uh, I hope he won't take offence when I'm saying that he's a radical bourgeois democratic thinker. I don't know whether he describes himself as a socialist anymore. I know he, he wouldn't say he was a communist. Uh, and from my own private conversations with him, he's not an anti-Zionist, uh, although obviously he's given great support to the Palestinian struggle. But Norman comes from this from an entirely different perspective. Uh, let me give you an example. Uh, uh, and I think we do need examples. Uh, what should you do if Israeli military spokespersons want to speak and are invited to speak on campus? Uh, do we simply allow them to come on uh, and hold their meetings and we, we will try and interject? Or do we try and stop them as students have? And I say quite clearly, war criminals and those who advocate on behalf of them have absolutely no right to speak. That was true in the Vietnam War when people like Samuel Huntington and others were prevented from speaking, as equally true today. Those who argue for the destruction of other societies don't themselves have that right. And I'll just finish with, with this really, uh, R.H. Tawney, who was a Fabian, uh, he wasn't a revolutionary socialist or Marxist, when he said freedom for the pike is death to the minnow. And that's equally true of freedom of speech. Speech does not take place in the vacuum, it is there for a purpose, and we have to understand those purposes. Thank you, comrades. Thanks very much, Tony, and uh, I'll hand it over now to uh, Norman. Uh, I'm going to try to be expeditious in my remarks. Uh, frankly, with all due regard to Tony, what he just uh, provided by way of introduction was just a lot of hot air and cliches. There's no systematic analysis. There's no attempt to come to grips with, first of all, what the purpose of free speech is, and secondly, to situate the struggle for free speech within the struggle of the left. Uh, the, uh, <clears throat> the expansion of the boundaries of free speech have been mostly, at least in the United States, I can't speak for the UK, uh, expanding the boundaries of free speech has been mostly a struggle of the left. Um, if you look at the books written on the origins of the First Amendment, um, uh, the First Amendment uh, uh, <clears throat> what's the word? It skips, it loses me for a moment. Uh, the adjudication of the Supreme Court and the First Amendment in the 20th century, uh, it's mostly cases brought by the left, the Communist Party, efforts to suppress uh, left, uh, uh, leftist organizing, leftist distribution of leaflets and so forth. It's almost the entire history is the history of the left trying to expand the boundaries of free speech. So historically, the two have gone uh, hand in hand. Uh, the struggles of the left, the struggle for the expansion of free speech. Even in the American Civil Liberties Union, uh, one of the founders of the American Civil, Liberty, Civil Liberties Union uh, was also one of the founders of the American Communist Party, Elizabeth Gurley, uh, Elizabeth Gurley Flynn. Now, there was a lot of hypocrisy there, for sure, by the communists. However, it nonetheless remains the fact that the struggle for free speech has always been a struggle of the left. The struggle to expand the boundaries of speech has always been a struggle of the left. Uh, that's the historical context about which a lot can be said, and time doesn't allow me. I, the word I was looking for was uh, First Amendment juris jurisprudence in our own Supreme Court, almost all of the jurisprudence on the uh, right of free speech is about cases brought before the court, before the high court, uh, uh, by people on the left, or people who are being prosecuted on the left. As to its purpose, what is the purpose of free speech? Well, there are two kinds of arguments when it comes to free speech. There's what you might call the natural rights argument, that is, uh, my right to speech is my God-given right, and nobody has the right to restrict what I want to say. 
as the German folk song puts it, die Gedanken sind frei, thoughts are free, and nobody has the right to restrict, restrict or limit my free thought. That argument, it is an argument, but it's not the argument that particularly interests me. Uh, for me, the main argument is the argument of the culture of the left. Uh, the other night I was watching a uh, BBC, no, it wasn't BBC, it was a British documentary on Eric Hobsbawm. I guess it aired last year in the UK. Uh, I only happened to stumble upon it a few days ago. And in, one, and in the documentary at one point, uh, Eric Hobsbawm makes the argument that the, uh, the left and the left, the Marxist left, and the liberal uh, uh, traditions, they both have a lot of common ground. He calls it basically there was a dialogue between the two, the liberal tradition and the left tradition. And uh, to some extent, I have to say, I didn't agree with him because people like Karl Marx for better or for worse, and I think probably for worse, uh, people like Karl Marx were so dismissive of folks like John Stuart Mill considering him so contemptible and so limited in intellect, I thought it was unfair. So uh, uh, Marx was very hostile to the liberal tradition, at least as it was embodied in people like his own contemporary, John Stuart Mill. But having said that, and there I thought that Hobsbawm was mistaken, having said that, Hobsbawm is obviously correct that the liberal tradition and the left tradition, they come out of the, a, a certain attachment, I've used a very abstract term, a certain attachment to enlightenment values, reason, the capacity to persuade through rational argument. That's part of the liberal tradition. It's part of the left tradition. Uh, it's unfortunate that it's all been forgotten now, but there's no question when you, you look at the left tradition, and it was part of the tradition that deeply influenced me, myself, growing up, the extent to which the leftist tradition is deeply rooted in the battle of ideas, ideas, reason. If you look at the famous um, questionnaire when Marx was put Karl Marx would put questions by his daughter. It was a kind of parlor game. And one of the questions that was put to Karl Marx was, what's your one vice? And his response was bookworming. He's always reading, bookworming. Uh, when Engels would say, come on, Karl, would you finish the goddamn book already? And he would say, no, I have to read one more book. And I have to read one more book. I have to read one more book. You go to somebody like Lenin in the midst of the civil war in the Soviet Union, in the midst of the civil war, what's he reading? He pulls off from his bookshelf Hegel's, philo uh, Hegel's logic. Hegel's logic he's reading in the middle of the civil war. When Hegel was once, excuse me, when Lenin was once asked about Marx's capital, he responded, nobody who hasn't, nobody who doesn't understand the whole, and he puts in italics, the whole of Hegel's logic can understand Das Kapital. And I had the good fortune in my youth of having been taught by the leading American Marxist economist, Paul Sweezy, and I still remember vividly in my mind's eye uh, Sweezy on the stage, and he quoted that remark from Lenin, and he said, I should hope that's not true, because there are very few people in the world who understand the whole of Hegel's logic. This is not a digression. It's not an excursus. That's the left tradition. Maybe you don't like that tradition. Maybe you think in the age of tweets and Twitter, that tradition is obsolete. But for those of them, those who call themselves Marxists or, or see themselves as part of that tradition, the Marxist tradition, uh, I don't see how you can separate that tradition uh, 
from the, the uh, uh, centrality of the struggle of ideas, of reason, of rational persuasion. It was said of Lenin, if he can get you in a room for three hours, he can convince you of anything. Yeah, this very powerful logic. Uh, <clears throat> amusingly enough, in law school, the one subject he got a B in, <laughs> he got a B in logic, which I find kind of funny. Um, that's the tradition. It's the tra tradition of Lenin. It's the, tra the tradition of Luxembourg. It's the tradition of that whole 19th century, late 19th century, early 20th century, Marxist tradition. And it certainly was one aspect of the tradition that appealed to me. And I'm not about, in my old age, I'm not about to junk, to jettison that tradition in the name of these silly catchphrases about fascism and racism and how we're going to let these people and those people organize uh, and that uh, these are life and death enemies. They faced life and death enemies back in those days. And when they did, when they did impose limits on speech, A, they did it with a lot of reservation. I don't want to get into the technicalities for your audience, because probably most of them haven't a clue what I'm talking about. But the 10th Party Congress of the Soviet Union, of the uh, Bolshevik Party, when they put limits on the forming of factions, Lenin had to make a thousand apologies why he was putting limits on the forming of factions. He said, it's the middle of the civil war and this reason and that reason. They were very apologetic about it. And the, the horrors of the civil war did not prevent people from like Rosa Luxemburg still insisting on the importance of free speech not because of an abstract value attached to free speech, not because of the, I have a right to say what I want, the natural right, but let Rosa Luxemburg put it in very practical terms. She said, apart from a few slogans or the expression she used, a part of a few, apart from a few signposts, she says, none of us even know the first thing about how to build socialism. It's still complete, a complete mist, a mystery, how you go about building this new society. And then in the, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the face of that fact, you have to have freedom of free speech, freedom of debate, in which the best ideas or the wrong, the best ideas went out, the wrong ideas are defeated. That's the only way you can proceed. You can't build socialism by fiat because nobody has a blueprint about how to proceed. So having said all that, where does that leave us? Tony has all of these caveats. I'm not going to let fascists have free speech. Oh, okay, all well and good, but who's a fascist? Fascist has no content any longer. It's like calling somebody a Zionist, a capitalist, they have no agreed on content. Now, Tony may have his definition of what's a fascist, his definition of what's a Zionist, his definition of what's an imperialist. He may have his definition. The problem is, Tony, probably only around two of your comrades at most agree with you on that definition. And then what? You silence everybody who disagrees with your definition of who's a fascist, your definition of who's a Zionist. You silence all of them. You silence all of them in the name of what? You're all knowing. You're infallible. Your definition is by virtue of it being your definition. It's the definition. Leaving aside everything else, the sheer presumption 
what John Stuart Mill called the presumption of infallibility, by which he meant the presumption, not that you think you're right. Of course, we all think we're right. The presumption of infallibility is when, and Mill puts it in italics, which is unusual for him. He doesn't usually use italics. He uses the force of his own words, but he puts it in italics. He says, the presumption of infallibility is when you decide for others what's true and what's not true. So when Tony describes a person, person X as a fascist, person Y as a Zionist, sure, it's within his right. He has the right to define it as he sees it. That's not the problem. The problem is Tony deciding for others. That is to say, A is a fascist, B is a Zionist, and therefore A and B shouldn't have the right to speak. Why? Because I, Tony Greenstein, have determined they're fascists. That's not how free speech proceeds. It's not how you find truth. It's a formula for just pure authoritarianism, pure dictatorship. It's frankly a ghastly formula, having lived enough of the 20th century and its uh, consequences, I feel very confident in saying those sorts of formulas are awful, not just because of the repression that inevitably results, not just because of the hypocrisy that inevitably results in public when you say no free speech for fascists, but free speech for me, I'm a communist, which is just the reverse of what liberals used to say. There was the famous article uh, by this ex-Marxist named Sid, uh, uh, Sidney Hook. He said, uh, the article was entitled, Heresy, yes, conspiracy, no. It was a famous article in the 1950s against the communists. It meant you're allowed to be a heretic, that is, completely disagree with received wisdom, but you can't be a, a conspiratorialist. You can't be part of a conspiracy. And at the time, there was the International Communist Conspiracy, as it was so-called. And so communists did not have the right to free speech because they weren't just heretics, which is permissible, they were part of a conspiracy. So now Tony says it's the fascists who are part of this conspiracy. And so they shouldn't have the right to free speech. He's using the same argument that was used against the communists in the 1950s. And so you have this huge problem of being a hypocrite when you present that position in public. The other tradition is you let people speak, you take risks in letting people speak because maybe they have something of interest to say. Maybe you learn something from them. So you take the risk up until the danger is posed of uh, violent uh, forms of violence, which cross the line from speech to conduct or speech to action. And so you take the risk. Now you might say, why should you take that risk? They're fascists. Well, I say, A, I don't know what a fascist is. So I don't want people silencing everybody because they believe anyone who disagrees with them is a fascist. And B, <clears throat> I, want, I want to take the chance that I might learn something of use short of that person <coughs> engaging in violent activity. Now, of course, the obvious answer to that is why should we wait till the last minute? And that was the whole history of 
US free speech jurisprudence. There was one tendency that said it was called the bad tendency school. The bad tendency school is the Tony Greenstein school. The bad tendency school basically says, we already know how evil fascism is. I've studied fascism. I know about the Hitler. I know about the Nazi Holocaust. We already know how evil it is. So why wait until the last minute that is just short of violence? Why wait until the last minute to suppress them? That's the bad tendency. The bad tendency can just be called, let's nip them in the bud tendency. That's Tony. Let's crush them before they might grow and expand. And then we know the Holocaust is right around the corner. And the other school of thought says, yeah, maybe they're a bad tendency. I'm not going to dispute that. But you know what? People with bad tendencies also have interesting things to say. And if we're concerned about rational thought, rational argument, we should allow for the maximum expression of speech so that we can winnow out the wheat from the chaff, what's useful from what's not useful. And I think if you're committed not to free speech in the abstract, not to free speech in the abstract, but if you're committed to truth and rational argument as prerequisites for creating, constructing, and building a more sane world, truth as a prerequisite for building, constructing a more sane world, then there's a very strong argument for letting the speech continue until and unless it crosses that line. It takes a risk, but not taking the risk, the, so to speak, nip it in the bud theory, to my thinking is a much bigger uh, a much bigger problem a much bigger danger it has nothing to do with me being a bourgeois democrat what, what do these stupid expressions mean they're just so contentless they're so hollow as if putting me in that category somehow diminishes me as a radical or a revolutionary or as a leftist Dear Tony, I paid my price. There's many a communist who's securely ensconced in academia. I lost my job 15 years ago. I never worked another day in my life. I don't care. I don't give a flying fig what idiotic, stupid, ignorant, pig-headed label you pin on me. I'm committed to truth, first of all, as a value that I value. I value truth. <clears throat> but beyond that, I'm a person of the left. And I don't believe you can create a rational, reasonable, sane world if you don't allow for the prerequisite, namely free speech, to figure out and find out what's true, what's not. So as Rosa Luxemburg says, to clear a rational path into that so far mist-filled future that we're all trying to find our way to.